Hare Krishna, dear devotees. My name is Deva Madhava Das. Welcome back to the GBC SPT page. Very happy to have with us today His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. He is uh, one of my role models, and uh, I dare to call him also a friend. <laughs> I'm very grateful to have him with us today. Welcome, Prabhu. Mm, thank you, Prabhu. I'm so happy to be here with you. In fact, I see this more as an opportunity to gain your association. Whenever <laughs> we have spent some time, I found that you have very good insights and very attractive ways of articulating your insights also. Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here with all of with you today. Well, I was feeling the same. This is a great excuse to get to talk to you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Chaitanya Charan Prabhu is not only deeply thoughtful, but he's he's prolific in what he does uh, in sharing Krishna consciousness with many different avenues of people, not only from his kind of native culture, uh, India, but also in the West. Uh, I've seen you now many times here in America, and I'm always impressed uh, and inspired by the way that you're able to relate to the local audience here, the same principles and concepts that you kind of grew up with in a very familiar way in India and leave them feeling like, yes, this is valuable beyond just the relative cultural experience that you had as an Indian boy growing up. But this is valuable for me, even as a, a Westerner. These universal principles that you presented from this culture of the Veda is something that even I can apply in my life. Uh, I've seen that many times over. So that's something of the framing we'd like to, to bring in the discussion today. But I think it might be valuable just to um, ask first off, and it's always fun also to hear how devotees joined. <laughs> so I'm not sure how many people are aware how you actually kind of became so serious uh, in the practice of your Krishna consciousness. Maybe you could share a little bit of that first. Sure. Thank you, Vroom. So <clears throat> I would say that there are broadly three strands of thought, which uh, uh, are three strands in my life at large, which eventually led to my uh, taking up to bhakti as a <clears throat> as a brahmachari. First was I always had a lot of faith and knowledge as a means for improving life, not just my life, but improving life of people. In the, I had a lot of faith in the power of knowledge. Mm. And when I started studying, when I started doing my engineering, I <clears throat> believed that is the study of I used to read biographies of science and how scientists and how they made a, came up with discoveries and other things. Mm. I'd tell you this is so thrilling. Mm, but then when I actually encountered uh, students and not just students, even faculty and researchers, I realized that they okay for most of them. I'm not generalizing for everyone, but for most of them, this seemed to be just like another job, mm. and that the scientific knowledge had in no way was in a scientific expertise was in no way a predictor of <clears throat> one's virtues or even one's desire to serve society or to contribute to society. Mm. So it could be just a tool for earning a living. <laughs> it could be just a tool to become famous. So, I and I also found that even Top, top students who were toppers and who were good in research and brilliant in their sciences, they they had self-destructive habits. They went into smoking. They were, drugs were not so common that time, but smoking, alcohol, and not just casually, but sometimes quite damaging. Mm. It was also there. So I started wondering what's wrong. What is missing that knowledge is not necessarily, they have the knowledge to do things well. But which things are really beneficial for them, they didn't understand that. Mm. So that was one aspect of it. And um, I felt that knowledge must have some higher purpose. So when I read in the Bhagavad Gita 13, 8 to 12, that knowledge is actually in the form of virtues. Knowledge is not just in the form of skills. That mm. was quite a revelation for me. Mm. That, In fact, then I came to know that what the Bhagavad Gita is saying has also been a part of the Western tradition. That... <coughs> Socrates and Plato, and even Aristotle, whatever differences Aristotle had with his teacher, previous teachers, they all saw knowledge in terms of virtue, knowledge in terms of inner control. Yes. But it was from the time of the scientific renaissance and thereafter, the renaissance and scientific revolution, that knowledge started becoming equated with power, not virtue. Mm. That knowledge is power. Francis Bacon famously said that. And while it is true, knowledge is power, but he was using it in a very specific sense 
knowledge, scientific knowledge will give us the power to control the outer world mm. and thus bend nature to our will and enable us to become uh, become happier. So that shift of knowledge in terms of power has led to a lot of advancement of technical skills. So I felt that I could also become a software engineer. I did my electronics and telecommunication engineering. And the general mm -hmm. career path for students was at that time become a software engineer because that's where the prestige and the money was. But I felt that the knowledge in terms of values is what is needed in society. Hmm. And I felt that uh, knowledge of the skills, the software skills, again, not minimizing software professionals at all. It's hard work and it's important work in today's world. At the same time, I felt that that's not what I wanted to uh, contribute my life, uh, contribute in my life. Another aspect was also that, um, as I said, out, because of the knowledge only, uh, value knowledge, I was a part of a social welfare organization where I focused primarily on uh, education. I would go to students who were underprivileged and offer them free tuitions in subjects that were considered difficult, math, English, history, some things like that. And I found that in many of their lives, they, they were eager to study and learn, at least many of them, but their parents, especially their fathers, were alcoholics. Mm. And their home life was a mess. Mm. And I started realizing that how much can I, how much difference is it going to make for these kids learning some, some language, learn history, it's valuable, but mm. it's, uh, it would be much better if we could work on that. Mm. And then that's when I, uh, I talked with the leaders of our organization and then we decided to also offer some talks on helping people get free from alcohol and uh, things like that. And a small locality we adopted and we give talks, invited spe specialists to give talks and talk with people and those people became free. They became, we could say, they, uh, all the people in that particular small locality, they gave up alcohol. Mm. But then there's a local municipality election, local political election, and the candidate in order who voters brought two truckloads of free liquor for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and not only the fathers, but even their sons. Classic. They all drank. They all drank. <laughs> and I was quite dismayed at that time, but that time started making me think that. But actually, it's there is something self-destructive within us. Mm. It's like an instinct for or an impulse for self-destruction within mm -hmm. us, which works against us. Mm. So education, whether it is a technical education of math or English, or even education about the dangers of alcoholism or whatever, that may open new doors for us. But it's like there is something inside us which sabotages us, which prevents us from walking through those doors. Mm. That's when I read the Bhagavad Gita, and I noticed that. Uh, when Krishna Arjuna asked Krishna, Athakena Prayukto Yam Papam Charati Purushaha, what is it that makes one act self destructively? I felt this is what I was wanting to know. <laughs> and I felt that a very relevant and empowering section in the Gita. So then, how the Gita talks about self destructive desires being there as impressions within us and how they need to be purified. So I felt that that's, that's, good. that's what I would like to contribute. Mm -hmm. So those are two broad thoughts. I could go further, but I think I made my point here. I don't want to, this topic to monopolize the discussion. Was, mm -hmm. Sometimes we hear it said, nobody comes because of the philosophy. It's because of prashadam. It's because of association. But it might not be surprising for an intellect like yourself that you're actually attracted <laughs> by the philosophy. And that's what drew you into seeing the value of Krishna consciousness. So thank you for that. That's um, an interesting point. Yeah, I was definitely, prashadam was not my top priority. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet. So now let's transition into today's uh, service that you have uh, going on. You're, you're kind of really moving between these two, what some people see as divides, the East and the West. Uh, and you're, you're demonstrating uh, the ability to impact both those realms. And I think you've gained some insights from that work. So talk about maybe your first time coming to the West uh, as a, a traveling monk, brahmachari, preacher, what was that experience like? Um, you know, Prabhupada came and he had no idea what he was going to touch and what he, what he was going to eat and where he was going to go. I, I don't know if you were in that kind of darkness <laughs> about what your experience was going to be or something a little different. Okay. Maybe uh, before I come to the first American visit, I'll just give you a little background. So I was introduced in 1996, then for about 
12, 13 years, I was in one of the most conservative Brahmacharya ashrams in India, ISKCON at large. Mm. And I followed the disciplines and everything very strictly. So then after that, my guides encouraged me to uh, <clears throat> to, ex- uh, to diversify. From 2015, I have been traveled. 2014, actually, was the first year I traveled first to Australia and then to America. And since then, before the pandemic, I have been spending almost uh, nine months outside India. And mainly in America, about five to five and a half months. And then Australia, UK, New Zealand, and some other parts of the world. So even before I started coming to the West, I noticed a significant difference uh, in terms of how devotees interact with each other. Mm-hmm. So I had been in Radha Gopna temple. I was at that time based in Pune, but I had been in Radha Gopna temple. And there was a senior Prabhupada disciple who is also a spiritual master in a moment, very intellectual. And I had come to meet him. And uh, he had his... Uh, so I talked with him and I asked him some questions. He says, you know, my assistant will know about it. And then normally if there's a spiritual master and the assistant... The idea would be maybe the spiritual master has a kind of some kind of bell they will ring, and then they, the spiritual the assistant will come. But here, this particular uh, Vaishnava, he himself got and uh, got up and went. Are oh, you becoming a little glitchy? I'm not sure if that's just me or. I'm going to take Prabhu off and maybe add him again, see if that helps us out. Can you hear me now, Prabhu? Okay, now that's better. We got just to the point where the spiritual master was going to ring the bell to summon the disciple. <laughs> that's what you were yeah. expecting. And then something else happened, but we don't know what that is yet because it okay, so grows up. The spiritual master got out of their, their room and went to the next room where their assistant was staying. And they started talking. And the assistant was sitting on the chair and the guru was standing and they're talking with each other. <laughs> I was a little taken aback. At least you should stand up. You should offer your guru a seat. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first uh, interaction. And nobody, neither of them, the guru was not taking offense. And the disciple was also answering the question properly. <laughs> so it seemed like a completely normal interaction. Hmm. So then I wondered what was happening. And that was probably the first inkling I had that. Uh, Overall, the culture of interaction in India is quite vertical. This is the person in authority, this is the person in subordinate. Mm. It's not just spiritual master and disciple, but it's all interactions, there is a certain level of verticality in it. Mm. So, whereas in the West, the culture is significantly horizontal, at least in terms of externals. Now, I had some idea about it when I was working in a software company, they encouraged us to call our bosses by the first name. That was unheard of. <laughs> Normally, we would use a boss by sir or ma'am. Yeah. But they just use first name. So I knew that was there in the professional world. But that, it was there in the devotional world also. This was my first experience of that. Mm. And that is something which has, which has uh, repeatedly been experienced by me whenever I have uh, been in the West, right, from my first trip. So actually, I was one of the devotees, one of the contributors in editing the Journey Home book before it was published. Mm. So when Ms. Jones Radhanath Maharaj, my spiritual master, had given me that book, and I went through it and asked, he asked me, what did you like about it? So now most devotees, they like the adventurousness, the many ex- ex- remarkable experiences. Yeah. I said, that, that is remarkable. What I said, Maharaj, I like the tone of the book. That He said that you don't seem to be like a teacher telling students. You seem to be more like a seeker sharing your experiences with others. Mm. And then Maharaj appreciated that point. He said, you know, that is the exact tone you need for Western outreach. Mm. And he said that if you learn that, India is also becoming westernized. Mm. So you'll be able to reach out to a significant number of people. So the, so in one sense, it's a tone in, in, in writing and speaking, but also the mood in interacting, the, not the mood, the mode of interaction, you could say. Mm. So that verticality and horizontality is a significant difference. And that... Oh, so when I went uh, went to the West also, <coughs> during my first trip, I met many, in one sense, the Prabhupada disciples are a rarity in India. Mm. Whereas there are many Prabhupada disciples in the West. 
but when i interacted with them they were so down to earth so friendly so approachable mm. and uh, and even sanyasis and gurus also not just uh, not just proper disciples who may not have those designations everybody was quite approachable that week so and i realized that is the ethos so this shapes this leads to a lot of differences in the way krishna consciousness needs to be presented in the way certain activities are perceived so i'll come to that but that was my major uh, point of differentiation then i when i studied a little bit of the intellectual history of the west mm. it seems that because of many instances of abuse of power by those who were in power whether it is the catholic church doing inquisitions or even their those in the reformation they got power and they persecuted those who were not uh, following their particular version of christianity or whether it was hitler and mussolini or whoever else yeah. there is there is this history and it has almost scarred the collective memory of the west mm. where there is a there is a great fear of the abuse of power mm. whereas in india what is ingrained more and i would say this is also in china and russia eastern cultures you could say yeah but the chaos that will result by not having authority mm. so what is prominent is very different the the dangers of the abuse of authority where is is what is prominent in the minds in the west and the dangers of not having an authority of rejecting authority that is what yeah. is prominent in india and that's what let leads to significant differences in how krishna consciousness needs to be presented and pursued that's one major point i would like to say yeah that's a really beautiful characterization <clears throat> um and yet on both sides whether you're coming from east or west there's a need to come into this appreciation of the eternal hierarchy <laughs> that krishna yeah, consciousness plays out um and and we even see that there's this deference to authority is sometimes it gets in the way for indians who who don't invest or people in the east in general who just kind of defer to authority uh out of tradition and habit rather than from a place of of real heartfelt fidelity and on the the western side i often tell my peers who after two or three years you know they look like fireworks they they do this great big entrance into krishna consciousness shave the head change the clothes surrender their life for two three years and then after two three years they kind of fiddle out and and they don't look so inspired or or developed anymore i often tell them what brings you to krishna consciousness is what keeps you from really going deep in it also which is that your need to reject authority and to you know kind of go against the grain and once you're a part of the krishna conscious community then that need to reject authority is no longer very helpful <laughs> because the need is to surrender to the the uh, absolute authority so how does iskon as an organization navigate these tensions uh, and you could say cultural proclivities to bring people to the authentic experience of authority that's supposed to be had mm very good point it's we reject authority Uh, to come to iskon and then we have to accept authority that's true in one sense it's true in india also uh at one level the check if you have young people they are more or less following the authority of their parents mm. so that rejection is required but what has happened is there is overall an understanding also that authority has to be accepted okay i mean i reject this authority and accept that authority but i would say even in the west there are of course you know west is such a big word mm-hmm. you know whom are you referring to in the west you know in america you know you could say texas and florida are very different from say california and new york yes so what what are we referring to is to uh, is relative but still broadly speaking even if there are authority structures they are still quite vertical so they they are quite horizontal Mm. they definitely more not as vertical as they are in india mm. so even if somebody uh, even if a young young children are growing up with their pa- uh, are being raised by their parents the parents don't exert authority by the way say might indian or chinese parents might do so that also is a factor at uh, what I, uh, how this leads to the next step i would like to be, do you want to add something to this or should i take the next point over here no yeah i would like to hear from you okay thank you so th- what this leads to is that uh, <clears throat> now it's not that 
in the West also, there are people who respect authority and want to follow authority. They're there. In India also, there are people who strongly question authority and reject authority. They're also there. Mm. But what happens is, both of these people are outside the main demographic for ISKCON. You know, if you want to talk in terms of, say, right and left, if I may say so, that now the words right and left in different parts of the world also can mean different things. Mm -hmm. But I try to put it simply as, <clears throat> the right refers to those who emphasize what is right about existing systems and structures in the society or in the world. Mm. You know? This is the hierarchy and this is how it's working and this is what it's doing and therefore respect it. <clears throat> Whereas the left refers to those who are concerned about those who are left behind by the existing systems and structures of society. Mm. So now, in general, in India, the people whom we attract are the people on the right. Yes. And in the West, the people whom we attract are people on the left. Mm. So it's not so much, I, in my understanding, the cultural issue is very much there. That Indi Is it Indian culture and Western culture? I feel it's also an issue of the kind of demographic we are attracting. Mm. So in India, it's a, uh, it, it, I would say, it, it right in the sense that we attract people on the right. Now, again, uh, often the word right has a negative connotation. I'm not talking about right wing extremists, it's just people who recognize the value of structure and tradition. So for mm -hmm. many Indians, uh, taking up bhakti, and seriously bhakti, it's more or less aligning with their own tradition. Mm -hmm. And this tradition has sustained India for millennia. India is probably a uh, the only surviving ancient civilization which still has a tangible link with its ancient civilizations. Mm. China is also there, but there is very little of, say, immediate influence of uh, ancient Chinese Chinese religions or belief systems in modern-day China. But in India, again, I, no, no, minimizing, uh, no minimizing any country, but India, there is a significant link between what was there thousands of years ago and what is there today. Mm. There are variations also. Yeah, but for... But the point is that it's like aligning with something that has sustained Indian society and Indian culture in, for, for millennia. So the people who are likely to do that are people who are on the right, in general. So we have quite a aggressive leftist intelligentsia in India. But those people who are of that nature, they don't even consider coming to ISKCON. We are going to very very elite institutions. We have youth centers in IITs and uh, other top institutes in India. And we are attracting intelligent people, no doubt. But we are attracting intelligent people of a particular nature. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in the West, if somebody were more aligned toward the right, then they would, even if they have a spiritual thirst, they would most likely affiliate with the religion of their birth, with something which is a part of their tradition. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it is people who are going to reject the existing power structures. They feel that I don't, I don't belong over here. This doesn't seem right to me. So we attack that kind of people. So I feel it's uh, the, the divide is, if we emphasize so much on, too much on the culture, it's India and West. Uh, I, I think we may miss out on the point that it's not so much cultural as you could say uh, more of psychological orientations innately. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's a beautiful point. And I wonder, is there, do you see a potential for attracting the, the opposite uh, spectrum, uh, the opposite side of the spectrum in, in the different societies that we see? Is, is it possible to bring in an intellectually leftist Indian? Is it possible to bring an intellectually rightist uh, American or, over to Perfect. Krishna's camp? That's, uh, that's a good question. Um, now, I have talked with different devotees in the West. And uh, again, I, I have talked with a lot of devotees and I have interacted with people also. When during my classes, I have given, especially after the classes, when I spend time with people. Mm. In general, many senior Prabhupada disciples have told me that you know, we have never really attracted people who were established in mainstream society in the West. Mm. Mm. So... 
we we have of course attracted very many talented intelligent uh, brilliant people but it is before they became they were on the chart they were young and before they get, became established in top positions in society yeah that's right so, right. so it's like bhakti tirth maharaj was in he was in yale prince in ivy league yeah, princeton yeah so princeton sorry princeton yeah yeah so there are people like that they are maharaj also in a top university so we attracted people like that so they could have gone on and become established in society in big positions but in general people who are established in the society in the west we don't attract them so much no and uh, with respect to india uh, i would say that see the left is a vocal is a highly vocal and highly visible minority in india hmm. they they shape the intellectual landscape significantly but i don't know whether they have a influence on people at large so is it possible to attract a person who is a leftist ultimately krishna can do anything but <laughs> but we have to depend on him for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i would say that the existing way iskon is in india it's very unlikely that somebody from the left will will consider becoming a part of a movement like iskon hmm So incidentally now as this con is spreading in india mm, that uh, uh we are gaining this con is very highly respected in india and not even if we don't have people becoming we have a lot of people becoming devotees but we have a lot of uh, top politicians business leaders social leaders uh, and others appreciating this con quite well and they are often well wishes of well wishes of our movement who yeah. help us in various ways so we men uh, so we are a established part of the you could say the indian religious and spiritual cultural landscape mm. we may not be the top spiritual or religious spiritual organization in india but it is we are a part of the uh, quite a respectable on the map figure in the landscape yeah so why am i making this point does <clears throat> the main reason for this is that you no know, uh, each uh, because in our own way india has been successful in reaching out to significant number of people so the mode of outreach that is being used as long as it is successful then there is not much need felt to explore something else hmm. to investigate something else right so as long as direct preaching is successful how do we really need form of indirect preaching well the on, the only major indirect preaching we have in in iskon india is in the form of self help where you get you self help topics to bring people to spirituality and then people take up serious spirituality <clears throat> and of course we have social initiatives like a tribal care which is more humanitarian humanitarian comes spiritual but these are these are considered supplementary the major is where there is direct outreach now <clears throat> just to bring a curious bring a very significant dynamic to this mm. that i have talked with many devotees who are doing western outreach and my spiritual guides encourage me to try to spend time with those uh, devotees who are doing western outreach learn from them and assist them in whatever i can so i have heard that uh, many devotees who do western outreach they feel uncomfortable getting inviting people from western outreach to come to a conventional iskon program mm. so that they feel like okay this is a little different and uh, mm. it's basically too religious we are joining a we are, are we joining a indian religious sect or something like that and there are various reservations they have but the point and this is well known and i understand the reservations but what is significant is at least at four places like in the western world where there are a vibrant uh, vibrant centers for western outreach and there are of course indians also indian devotees who are assisting and supporting those centers those indian devotees told me that we feel uncomfortable inviting our colleagues to these western centers mm-hmm. so it goes both ways so why because they said that you know our colleagues are these indians who have gone to the west they are usually well established in society they have some good positions yeah. and their colleagues are also in similar positions so Make for them families i would say not just the pious families is one thing of course but it is also that 
they're socially in influ- socially in a respectable position mm. so they feel that um, if they come to a western outreach center they feel that you know okay these are not the kind of people i usually mix with <laughs> so it's not just that they are of a different ethnicity it's yeah. just that they are from a different you know they many of many people who will be exploring spirituality may not necessarily even be worried too much about a career hmm. yeah that will take care of itself i i'm on the search i want to find some meaning in life i want to find some purpose in life so so that distance and the discomfort because of the distance runs both ways hmm. so that's also i would say just a further illustration of this this the difference not being so much cultural as more of like i would say i don't know what is the word for right and left what is that it's not i don't want to use the word political ideological. it's more psychological ideological okay but in this case it's more of psychological orientation hmm right there are, when we are using the word right and left it's more in terms of psychological orientation hmm <clears throat> yeah i think that's fair to characterize it that way and it leaves our society in a bit of a, a lurch as we would say here in the west <laughs> <laughs> things are um there's a kind of stalemate happening i see that in many places and and there's this um adversarial almost attitude the indian devotees versus the local or western however you want to characterize it and there's there's a kind of subtle antagonism and in some places it's an overt antagonism so what can you uh do to share especially in india it's not as much of an issue because you don't have the two local populate you know the two populations so close but in the west um you know most of the temples were rescued by the indian congregation in the 80s and 90s and without them we wouldn't have those uh temples so anybody that's silly enough to try to dismiss that community and their efforts is that's a different issue but after you know now things have settled out and there's this subtle or overt antagonistic mood what can you say to those communities to to try to help massage that out and and come to a healthier way of relating to one another okay that's it's you know, it's always easy to suggest what to do actually doing <laughs> it and dealing with the issues is tough but just to nuance the point you see india is also very big and india is also culturally very diverse mm. so when you talk about india what are we referring to in india so for example i was i am quite closely connected with one temple and they focused on english outreach they had their main most of their classes in english mm. and then then i was i had gone for one i think it was 2018 or something i had gone for international tour and came back and they said that we have decided to make all our bhagavatam classes in hindi now <laughs> i said why is that they said that we got a consistent feedback now you can use two words congregation and community congregation is broadly the devotees for a society temple and community is the larger system of well wishers that are there so in the the community gave the feedback that you know if you have classes in Hin- english we don't really feel that you belong to us or we belong to you mm. so they said that they had to they there was a big temple in the the temple needed the broader support of the broader community also and they wanted to connect of course we want to do outreach but the point is that they needed to do multiple they needed to do what was required mm. to cater to that audience they are still having english classes but the main classes the sunday class and most of the bhagavatam classes they they were supposed to have in hindi because that's what connects with the this a metropolitan city so it connects with the broader audience over there now we see this in mayapur also the international headquarters we have english bhagavatam class we have Beng- bengali bhagavatam class so we 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 need diversity even within within india mm. so i would say that uh, recognizing the need for diversity in different parts of the world is important and in providing space for that so we don't have to have like watertight or absolute category like indians and westerners that sometimes some indians might also be attracted to a more horizontal ethos it depends on which indians they are even i would say that say i am around, uh, the indian youth they are almost like one generation younger to me now mm. 
and I interact with them, but they are very different from my generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Usually different. Yeah. So, which Indians we are talking about also varies. But if we rather than uh, if we have broad modes of outreach or uh, different different modes of outreach for different audiences, I think and recognize that different people need different ways of presentation. <laughs> So that is where things could become much. Uh, we could have, we could say, diversity. Then we could have cultural. Again, I I feel it's more than cultural. It's psychological diversity rather than cultural. Mm-hmm. It's psychological diversity while sharing a spiritual commonality. We all want to ultimately develop love for Krishna, but our minds are made in a particular way. that we 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 need presentation in a way that that makes sense to us yes it's a, so that i would say recognizing the need for that psychological diversity would be very important and it is happening gradually the challenge i feel is that maybe there is a there is a extreme there is a again a vocal minority of those on the extreme left and on the extreme right mm. those on the extreme left they seem to reduce what happens in india this is simply indian mundane indian culture that has nothing to do with krishna consciousness and those on the extreme right in india they reduce what is happening in the west to to this is simply the expl- uh, this is simply the influence the contaminating influence of of the tamasic and rajasic western culture and this is not conducive for krishna consciousness so i would say that reductionistic tendency that is uh, that is a challenge that if we can avoid that and the need for diversity can be accommodated if that reductionistic tendency is avoided yeah i, re- I really want to highlight that point that uh the tendency to see the pro- the need for diverse environments as a problem in and of itself as some kind of indictment of a lack of krishna consciousness in that community um i think that's part of the problem that it's seen as a problem instead of just a natural phenomena within you know human society i can remember a letter uh shri prabhupad wrote to one of his disciples a leader in a in a local kind of metropolitan area and the black community in that ha- area had started to have their own programs basically for you know their people and the devotee was writing saying you know prabhupad this doesn't seem healthy this doesn't seem right and prophet wrote back birds of a feather flock together <laughs> what's the problem if they feel comfortable oh, okay. in, in their own you know community uh with people that look and and feel like them socially and they're chanting hari krishna then that's the real goal and we don't mind that they need to to feel that kind of comfort from the external level and so that that allowance of that need for most people who are not at on the paramahamsa platform I think is a really beautiful point to kind of bring to communities in general that it's it's not necessarily something wrong that there's these different divisions it's quite natural. Yeah. It's a it's true and I, and I don't think that there is aggressive opposition to that by uh, by anyone it's just that the the most extreme examples of both get highlighted. so mm. for example those who are from the west they may they may often highlight the the problems associated with indian culture uh and you know this is this problem this 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 we can give, easily give a list of problems yeah and those who are on the right in india Starting they will highlight all the india. problems in the west and you can also easily, easily highlight those problems mm. so i feel if we could avoid those and especially if those who are actually tangibly moving toward krishna consciousness helping others to move toward krishna consciousness if they could come together a little bit more and talk with each other then yeah. it helps a lot now i have i have been interact with many indian leaders and i and i talk based on my experience in the west what the situation is how things are mm. i find that many many of them are understanding not that i know everything about what is happening in the west not that i can i can uh, i can address all issues but to the extent where i have interacted and explained i feel it's possible it's just that we need more guhya makhyati pruchyati i think that's the single biggest thing which is lacking in our movement right now is 
that gohiya makhati puchti sitting down and talking and sharing one's heart's concerns yeah and sharing one's heart's aspirations without understanding that heart if you just look at each other's actions hmm. and often we look at the most objectionable actions of each other <laughs> <laughs> it just becomes unfortunately polarizing yeah you're reminding me i was when i first started coming to the temple as you know can't even call me a bhakta yet uh but all the all the indians were either prabhu or mataji that was it, it was just prabhu or mataji i didn't know anyone's name and then this uh devotee jugal kishore who was a brahmachari he was from detroit he's black body and he was running a little bhakti riksha and so he invited me there and he knew everyone's name and it it totally transformed my my sense of the congregation in detroit in general because he he knew them as people and i hadn't seen that kind of interaction yet uh, the the west oh, and the, the indians you. kind of relating to one another as people <laughs> instead of just the ceremonial kind of hari bol culture of of devotees that we see at a sunday feast and when i saw him in their homes and and talking to their children and asking about how work was going it just like turned the lights on i was like oh yeah they're people too <laughs> and i can have conversations on that human level with them and we'll find so many things to connect about and sure there might be differences you know culturally psychologically but it, in the heart of hearts we're all looking for the same thing in mostly the same ways um so that that's beautiful and and if you if communities don't have that example of persons who are who are making those inroads so to speak i think it's very difficult to to get out of the the secularization the the kind of stereotyped ideas of one way for this guy one way for the other <coughs> so this is a beautiful point you made uh, that see our spirituality is meant to meant for enhancing our humanity mm. not for eliminating our humanity as mundane mm. Mm. so that is where i think the one big challenge comes up yeah If sometimes we have this category of material and spiritual and i feel they are they are quite unhelpful categories Mm. it's like in material there is sattva rajas and tamas and there's a big difference between the two mm. it's like say you know somebody is categorized as asian well what do you mean by asian <laughs> there are indian there are chinese there are japanese there are filipino yeah. there are in middle east and they are all asia and they are hugely different yes so it's a so the human the human level of interaction with each other if um, that is uh, that is highlighted that is uh, that is uh, that is what we stress on more and more mm. then things will fall in place because ultimately we are not uh, right oriented people or left oriented people we are for most of, we are human beings and we can say at our core we are spiritual beings before we realize that and can live that in our life we are human beings mm. so sometimes say if say this is my humanity this is your humanity and on top of that that my human there is my spirituality and this is your spirituality about that so what happens is if we don't you do respect to the humanity the so humanity becomes like this the spirituality and we may see that okay my human my spirituality is going to grow as per my humanity mm. my culture my psychology my upbringing <clears throat> so if i diminish my humanity and then focus mm. only on my spirituality and i diminish your humanity and focus only on your spirituality Mm. then we may see a lot of differences yes you are doing like this i am doing like this but uh, if we learn to focus on our humanity first and then our spirituality mm. then things can move forward much much better so it's sometimes we say focusing on the spirituality is unifying <laughs> yes yeah. the knowledge of knowledge of mode of goodness which is focusing on spirituality is unifying right but you know how do you see spirituality we can't really perceive spirituality can i mean unless somebody is very realized mm. the idea of that somebody is not the body but they are the soul it's a intellectual abstraction basically it's very abstracted <laughs> exactly it's very ab- it's abstraction <clears throat> so what what can we focus on that unifies us at present mm. yes in principle we can say it's our spirituality but if we consider the expressions of those spirituality they may be quite different and then the spirituality which is meant to unify us because we can't pursue the essential spirituality we can only pursue the expressed spirituality 
Mm. And the express spirituality, maybe in India, we are doing kirtans in a particular way, using a particular set of instruments. In the West, we do use a set, we use a different set of instruments. The express spirituality becomes quite different. Mm. So, in one sense, uh, our spirituality in principle can bring us together. In practice, I feel that maybe it's we need a little more humanity in bringing us together. So, if we just started seeing that, yeah. yeah I I recognize I'm a Shri Prabhupada disciple. He he was in the last days of his life, mm. and he had been uh, like an extreme critic of people who he felt were not doing the right things. And he told me that before bef- uh, a few days before he departed, and I, sp- I got to spend some time with him. Very exalted Vaishnava in his own way. He said that I've come to realize somebody has been serving Prabhupada for 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years. And they feel that they this is the way to serve Prabhupada. You know, even if that seems wrong to me, I need to fo- I, I need to focus more on on what they have learned by from their 50 years of service to Prabhupada rather than what they are doing, which is objectionable for me. Hmm. So I think that focusing on commonality, whether it is the human commonality or the commonality of our intent to ultimately uh, become Krishna conscious and serve our Kondrachas mission. That that is what is important. Beautiful. Um, I'm going to frame one of the reasons doing that, which you just suggested, connecting <clears throat> with each other's humanity can be so difficult, especially in today's 2021. And then I'd like you as, as a kind of closing because we're, our time is on a crunch today because we, there's another program on the page <laughs> at 10 o'clock our side. Um, could you give some practical advice for devotees who feel inspired and how, how to connect with the humanity of another person, how to uh, bridge those gaps, so to speak? But I, I'd just like to frame one reason I see why that's such a unique challenge, especially today, and it's it's because of the internet, <laughs> the very thing that's bringing this conversation together today, right now. The globalization mm. of culture across the world is actually such an unnatural challenge for most people to have to deal with. The devotees of West Bengal 500 years ago didn't even have to know about or really ever see the devotees in Gujarat, what to speak of the devotees in Paris <laughs> or Sao Paulo or New York. And to to have such a, a confrontational, really, experience of other cultures on top of trying to assimilate the highest culture, Krishna consciousness, it leaves people, I think, feeling under, you know, incapable of, of blending all of that together in a, a healthy way. And so that then it almost necessitates this need to like push away the other cultures, because it's too much to have to deal with and assimilate. It takes a very high level of realization and intellect um, with all that exposure to so many other cultures. So knowing that most of the people we connect with, whatever side they come from, have all of this overexposed cultural experience, what are some tips you can give to help people start to bridge those gaps locally, have conversations with people that they may not otherwise uh, connect with? No, I have a seminar which I quite less internet in the three modes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So it's actually internet can be used, it's ultimately used by human beings. Hmm. And there is a lot of sattva guna in the internet also. You can get so much knowledge about so many fields so easily. And the people who have prepared that knowledge, say if you have online encyclopedia, things like that, there is a certain level of sattva for people to make those also. Hmm. So I won't say that internet itself is the problem. The main challenge is that in the physical world, if I am in a sattvic place, to go to a tamasic place requires some significant amount of uh, at least physical movement. If I want to go from a temple to a bar or somewhere like that, it's it's a significantly different. I have to go geographically to a very different place. But on the internet, I can shift from sattvaguna to rajas or tamas by just one click. Mm. So the it's not the internet is not the problem. It's that it's that shifting is so easily available. Mm. So I might be hearing a class which is sattvic and which is inquire sattva guna and shuddha sattva within me, and the next moment I can shift to some website which is which is focused entirely on 
or so some Facebook forum or something like that, some posts that focus completely on criticizing somebody mm. and demeaning and devaluing. Mm. So in one sense, when we are on the social media, we don't know whether the next post that I'm going to read is going to Satvik, Rajasik or Tamasik. That's right. It's like a Russian roulette. Every time you scroll down, <laughs> you don't know if the bullet's going to be there <laughs> or a blank or something between. <laughs> so, so because of that, uh, while at one level, people who are in Sattva, they can, uh, they can connect with each other better and they can actually build bridges. So that's, that's very much possible and desirable. Hmm. But it is like people who are in uh, Rajas and Tamas. Now, generally, we don't say that it's a devotee that transcendental. My understanding is all devotees are transcendental in terms of their ultimate aspirations, their ultimate values. Uh, but in terms of their functional values, we all have our modes hmm. in terms of how we function in the world. So, if, uh, if those who are in Rajas and Tamas, they will often gravitate towards some content rajas and tamas and that will really polarize so if we if we are a little more discerning in what we observe and what we interact whom with we interact what we get in, involved with so that helps a lot and um, if we create more sattvic content what you are doing i also have a monks podcast where i where you also come mm-hmm. and you have spoken quite wonderfully over there so i feel if we create more sattvic content where we have discussions and dialogues, that will also help a lot. And uh, overall, it, Shuddha Sattva is actually quite far away. It, it, is, it is our aspiration. <laughs> it is our aspiration and we want to go there. But what happens is that instead of getting to Shuddha Sattva, we presume we are at Shuddha Sattva hmm. and then conflate Raj Sattva Rajas and Tamas entirely. So if I think I am Shuddha Sattva, then I, I may actually be believing in Raj, behaving in Rajasik or Tamasik way. Yeah. But I don't realize that. And mm. I don't, I can't, and somebody points it out to me, so no, I'm motivated by the desire to serve. Well, maybe, maybe not. And we can't know anyone's heart. But I'd say that if we just try to cultivate a little more Sattva in the mm. way we function, that could be very helpful. And uh, as devotees... There is this, uh, this Prabhupada. There is one of my favorite pastimes, Prabhupada, is that when Prabhupada asks, How do we know your followers? Prabhupada didn't say that they chant 16 rounds, they follow four regular principles, they wake up for Mangal Arti. <laughs> he said they are perfect gentlemen and ladies. Mm. So that is Prabhupada is focusing on sattvic values. Mm. What is perfect when gentlemen and ladies means? That means sattvic values. Mm. So even Krishna in the 12th chapter of the Gita uh, focuses on. Uh, virtues that endear a devotee to him. Hmm. It's significant in 12.13 to 20. There are eight verses there and not and all those verses end with such devotees are dear to me. Hmm. But not one of those verses is saying who hears about my who hears about my glories, one who chants my holy names. Hmm. He's not talking about that. He's talking, you could say, almost human virtues. Yes. So one who is one of the beautiful verses is Yasman no dujate loko, loka no dujate chaya. One who does not disturb others mm. and one who is not disturbed by others. Mm. Now we see today in today's world that actually as devotees only we are getting disturbed by other devotees and we are disturbing other devotees. Yeah, actively. So, <laughs> sorry? Actively, actively. Actively trying also. <laughs> actively, that's, that's true. So Again, uh, if I equate roughly, now it's not a perfect equalization, but mm. if it's sattva, sattva with humanity, broadly speaking, humane values, mm. then a little bit more of sattva would be very helpful. So, in general, I find it sattva that builds bridges. Shuddha sattva can ultimately, but it's very, in general, number of people in Shuddha sattva are going to be very, very few. Mm. <coughs> and the bridges between those who are in Shuddha sattva may not immediately translate into bridges among those who are not there. Yes. That means that there may be two spiritual, the two exalted uh, Vaishnavas who may be very close to each other. But that being, their being close to each other may not automatically mean that their followers are going to be close to each other. So they may have to develop their own individual relationships by which they come close to each other. Mm. And uh, sattva can be quite helpful in that. I, I have a, I sometimes am a part of interfaith conferences. So I have an Islamic friend and he told me that actually it's easier for me to dis- 
to to have a rational or to have a meaningful discussion with moderates of other traditions mm-hmm. than extremists of my own tradition mm. it was such a revealing statement actually for me that that just we, we just reduce people to category they belong to this tradition mm. but it's not just that tradition it's it's their overall psychological orientation that determines whom they can bond with so i would say that will apply to apply within our movement also within the different expressions of the same tradition mm. not just the different traditions we have all the one tradition but different expressions of the tradition beautiful it's a very hopeful and practical point that by increasing uh sadvagun then we become natural ambassadors for krishna consciousness in the best way with all of humanity devotee or non devotee as you like um that's a really beautiful point thank you prabhu uh i unfortunately we have to end it feels like we could keep going but we'll i'm i'll just use the excuse to bring you on again <laughs> so we get to talk some more um is, is there anything you'd like to leave us with chaitanya charan prabhu yes bro uh this one last meditation please that uh, when prabhupad said that i build a house in which the whole world can live hmm. you know maybe what we need is that <clears throat> we stop imposing our expectation on how the house should be hmm. so one of the biggest uh, i mean maybe not the biggest so it's somehow prabhupad talk about principles and details i sometimes use that because some some aspect of krishna consciousness works for me you know we there's a tendency to universalize that mm. that this is what will work for everyone but it's possible to be possible to be completely committed to so for some devotees it's book distribution that is their greatest service for some devotees it is studying bhagavatam for some devotees it is actually going out and going out and preaching and giving classes for some devotees it is building temples for some devotees like that it could be different things so and some things really resonate with us so if you could see this as not as some some way in which krishna is reciprocating with me but that doesn't necessarily mean krishna is going to reciprocate in the same way with everyone else mm. that it is the diversity is not just simply because of individuals are different with different conditionings it is also because krishna reciprocates to different souls differently so it's not just something which is to be say diversity not something to be accommodated because we are conditioned it is to be also you could say spiritualized and appreciated or even celebrated because it is a part of our understanding of who god is and who we are in relationship with god so the mm-hmm. diversity the cultural diversity the psychological diversity that's like a ornament which shows how krishna can manifest in so many different ways so it can be a it will although i will talk about satvaguna and humil humanity but actually there is also uh, the spiritual vision it's opulence of krishna that um, the devotee can different devotees can attract can can be krishna conscious in different ways and can attract people to krishna consciousness in different ways wonderful yeah the spiritual world is not just a, a bunch of yeah. robots all behaving the same spiritual yeah. way <laughs> Quite. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Now I write on the Gita every day at gitadaily.com. So I wrote an article some time ago. At this mama that he had thamam prapadyan ti tham sathi vajamya four eleven. Mm. So I tra- I rendered it as what is Krishna saying over here? Is that from your place, at your pace, access my grace. <laughs> so from your place, at your pace, access my grace. That's the best. Everybody is actually accessing That's Krishna's right. grace only. <laughs> That's beautiful Prabhu. Thank you. That's a very sweet hopeful uh note to end on. Thank you Chaitanya Charan Prabhu for coming Thank on. Thank you Devanda Prabhu for this opportunity for Thank sharing you something for watching Great. us here on the SBT page. Please stay tuned. We always love to have wonderful thoughtful guests like Prabhu to come on. So stay tuned to the page to see who we're able to bring on next. Hari Krishna. Hari Krishna. Prabhu Prabhu ki jai.